let me know when everyone's in. I think we have just about everybody. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to have everyone here for the uh, Museum Environment 101 workshop. And it's going to be presented today, uh, taught today by Nicole Grabo of MAC, Midwest, Midwest Art Conservation Center, um, and, which is Minneapolis, right? Isn't it? Yeah. yeah so great. thank you for joining us today. Uh, I see we do have, uh, I think, all seven in attendance. So take it away, Nicole. Oh, and then if you have questions, please uh, put them in the, in the Q&A. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Chris. Hi, uh, I'm speaking today from Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Bade Ota Otanwe in the Dakota language. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. This place has a complex history, and I offer my respect and gratitude to the Dakota elders, as well as to our Ojibwe neighbors to the north. Thank you. I am Nicole um, and I'm gonna be sharing a PowerPoint with you today. So I've got you for two hours and we are gonna take a little break in the middle. I know two hours is a long time to stare at the computer monitor. Um, so hopefully we'll, I'll make it as interesting as I can for you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And... Um, making sure I can see my own screen as well. Okay, so here we are in the Museum Environment 101. Um, as Chris mentioned, I am from the Midwest Art Conservation Center. Um, I am uh, was trained as an objects conservator. I worked as an objects conservator for about 15 years before I transitioned into preventive conservation. I'm now a preventive conservator. Um, and just to kind of tell you a little bit about us, we are, there we are there. We're back in the lab for the most part now, but for the better part of a year, we were um, working remotely. Um, and I'm actually at my home office today. Um, we're small staff, um, we're a nonprofit, and we are devoted to the preservation and conservation of art and artifacts. We provide not just treatment, but also education and training for museums, historical societies, libraries, and other cultural institutions. And in the preventive conservation department, in fact, we do a lot of education um, specifically for collections care professionals for small to mid sized institutions. So, um, and just to kind of give a little bit of context, um, the American Institute for Conservation is our professional organization. And it defines conservation as the profession that's devoted to the preservation of cultural property through these four primary activities. Um, I know a lot of people think of conservation treatment first when they think of conservators, but it's actually about examination, documentation, and preventive care just as much as it is about the treatment itself. Um, in this slide, you can see my colleague Liz. She's one of our two paper conservators. She's working on a work of art on paper in our paper laboratory. We have, um, we have two paper conservators on staff. Uh, we just hired a third objects conservator, so our objects lab is up to three. We have three paintings conservators and a textile conservator who um, uh, works with us on contract, um, in addition to two conservators in the preventive conservation department, where I am. Um, and then thinking a little bit about terminology, preservation can be defined as the protection of cultural property through activities that minimize deterioration and damage and that prevent loss and informational content. Um, with the primary goal of prolonging the ex existence of cultural property. So this also goes back to the American Institute for Conservation. Um, and just to, you know, kind of distinguish between conservation, which is generally considered, you know, a profession done by conservators, and preservation, which is this whole range of activities that kind of work together to help to protect the cultural property and preserve its physical existence. Um, and then within conservation, preventive conservation itself is, um, it's a relatively new kind of specialization in the field of conservation. Conservators uh, specialize not by, um, not by geographic region or historical time period, the way that curatorial, that curators and curatorial departments often do, but instead we specialize by material group. So, you know, we have paintings, objects, paper, textiles, um, and then in preventive, 
what we're looking at in preventive is kind of whole collections care and um, long range and whole collections planning for organizations. So, you know, I kind of think of it as the um, primarily these activities that are shown on this slide with environmental control and monitoring, which is what we're going to be talking about today, kind of, you know, first and foremost, but also safe handling storage and exhibition, integrated pest management might be known as IPM, emergency preparedness and response, and then also reformatting and or duplication of collections materials to increase accessibility and, um, and enhance preservation of original materials by reducing um, handling. So, um, so, so given you know, these five things, uh, oftentimes I will define preventive conservation as the type of conservation that you don't have to be a conservator to practice um, and that collections caretakers, registrars, art handlers, that all of these um, staff members within institutions are practicing preventive conservation. So, um, so we're, you know, we're all kind of working together and we're all conservators in this sense. Now, when we speak about the collections environment, um, you know, there are a variety of different factors and these are the ones that I'm going to focus on today. And these are the ones that, you know, I think are um, arguably the most critical in enhancing preservation of collections materials of all types. So we're looking at visible light, which is the light that we can see. We're also looking at ultraviolet radiation. Um, this is the light that we can't see. Um, the, the UV, this is the component of sunlight that causes sunburn. So this is that higher energy wavelength um, and can be quite damaging for collections, um, as well as temperature, relative humidity, and as well air quality. Um, and although it's not generally considered one of the most like dynamic or exciting areas of collections care, um, providing a stable museum environment is hands down the most important thing that a museum can do to ensure the well-being of its collection. Um, jumping right to radiation, um, and you know we're going to talk about light and radiation first. Um, the damage that's caused by radiation, including visible light, is cumulative and it is not reversible. Um, the damage is not something that conservators can fix. Um, the photos that you see on this slide here show a textile that was on display um, in a museum, in a uh, sorry, in a university um, office. So it's not actually it's not actually a collection item. <laughs> it's not accessioned by the museum, but it is an art object that's on display in the offices. And what you can see is that although this is an interior space with no exterior windows and pretty modest lighting. The lighting source is right here. This is a fluorescent light. And it is, as you can see in this picture, it's hitting this edge of the textile, um, you know, pretty, pretty, um, pretty harshly. And when, um, when you lift that edge of the textile up, you can see that the strip that was exposed to the light from the, from the ceiling has faded so considerably in contrast to uh, the back, which has been against the wall and has been protected from the light. Um, and then that you can also compare the, the color on the front, which is not as bright or as vibrant as it is here on the back, but really it's that stark difference um, from the, that surface that's catching the light. And we look at um, not just the light that is generated or the light that is um, that is, exists in our display spaces and in our storage spaces, but also the angle of incidence. This can have um, a huge impact on the light that's received by the object. Um, this is the electromagnetic spectrum uh, showing you the range of radiation um, from the longer wavelength, shorter energy radio waves here at the left. Um, in most diagrams of the electromagnetic spectrum, those radio waves are on the left. Um, and then the, the waves become shorter, but the energy becomes higher as you progress to the right with these really super high energy gamma waves um, over on the right. And somewhere just right of the middle is visible light coming in right here. It's a re really narrow band. Um, and just to the right of it, just to the higher energy side, this is the ultraviolet region, which is actually fairly large. Um, and then if you jump to the other side of the visible light, 
you can see the infrared. Infrared is over here. We do sometimes talk about the effect of infrared on collections, but in that sense, we're talking more about heat and less about, um, and less about light itself. Technically, the term light can really only be applied to that which the human eye can see um, right here. What I like about this diagram is that it shows um, it shows the sun as a source and space as a source of a lot of these different types of radiation, but it also indicates um, where our atmosphere is serving to block the radiation that's coming in from outside. So there's this window here, the visible light window where the light gets in by which we can see. And then there's a radio wave window here where radio waves can come in and out freely. But most of the rest of this is blocked by um, by our atmosphere, which protects us from X-rays and gamma waves and things like that coming from space. So, um, so that's helpful. When we talk about measuring light, there are a number of different units that you may have heard of before. You may be very familiar with these. Some of you may not be. Um, I just wanted to walk you through a few of them. Um, the, they, there are more even than are given here. Um, this is just, a, just some of the most common ones. Um, but beginning with the candela, um, this is a, um, an international unit. The SI units are the international standards that are used uh, across countries. So those units tend to be, um, uh, well, standards. <laughs> um, and I definitely recommend using SI units as opposed to non-SI units um, because they're more likely to be things that are understood by um, other collections care professionals and adopted more widely. Um, but the candela is the SI unit that describes the luminous intensity in one direction. Historically, this was based on a wax candle, um, a, a common wax candle before the use of electricity and how much, um, how much intensity of light to that generated. And so if you look at this diagram here, you can see what this is kind of illustrating. Um, it's illustrating the light just in one direction, as opposed to the luminous flux. Um, which is radiating out in all directions from the, the candle. From the candle. Um, luminance is related to the candela. It's simply the candela per square meter. Um, and then you may have heard of a lumen, which is, that's the measure of this, you know, sort of overall, um, overall light that's emitted, the quantity of visible light emitted by a source. My favorite unit um, here is the lux right here. Um, this is this is what I commonly measure light in, um, and this is the measure of the illuminance per square meter. Um, so this is really the light that is received by a surface. So when you think about this light here, um, that's that describes more the light source than it does the specific incident of lighting on a collections material, for example. But if we're talking about how much light is hitting this patch of floor here, or imagine there was an artwork in this space, this is dependent on not just the brightness of the candle, but the distance from the candle and also the angle. So this, this Lux unit, this is the one that is most significant to me as, um, you know, as, a, as a collections assessor. Um, and it's gonna be the one that's most useful to you too, as you're looking at your collections environments, both in storage and on display. Um, the non-SI unit of the same measurement is foot candle, and that might be more familiar to you, um, but roughly, it's roughly equivalent to 10 lux. So the lux numbers um, are, let's see, which one's bigger? One foot candle equals, yeah, the luxes are roughly 10 times bigger than the foot candles are. Um, so it's good to be able to kind of use these two terms interchangeably and to kind of understand that we're not talking about the total emitted light, we're just talking about the light that's being received by a surface. And then the light levels for different collections materials are going to vary depending on what the collections material is. Um, the slide talks about sensitive organics. So these are the most light sensitive materials that we see in collections. These are going to be um, dyed textiles, paper materials, um, newspaper, basketry with natural dyes, and watercolors particularly. And textiles is going to be the biggest, um, probably the most ubiquitous source of light sensitive materials, very light sensitive materials. And the recommended light levels for these are just 30 lux over a period of three months. And when you'll see that number there, 5,000 lux hours per year, 
what we're doing there is we're taking a single measurement of the lux that is hitting that surface, and then we're multiplying it by eight hours a day, and then by 365 days to get up with to come up with a cumulative exposure that that artifact is receiving over the course of a year. Um, and what we find with that fixed 50 lux recommendation, you know, that recommendation is there for good reason. Um, these materials will fade very rapidly when with light levels that are higher. But it's also, if you're familiar with um, light levels, this is pretty low. These are pretty dim. Um, these are pretty dim settings, particularly for display. And what you'll find is that for your viewers to be comfortable, particularly if the collections materials that they're looking at have low contrast details or dark surfaces, particularly if your visitors tend to be older, um, or if someone wants to look at something really intensely for study, um, that you're going to need higher levels than this to really satisfy those demands. Um, which puts us into a bit of a conundrum in terms of collections management. How do we um, how do we balance preservation against access and make sure that materials are accessible to researchers and to members of the public without um, subjecting them to light levels that are going to damage them? Um, and this is a question without an easy answer, um, but one that you know I can give you some suggestions. Also, just to note, lux is the measurement for visible light. There's a different me measurement for um, ultraviolet radiation that's typically measured in microwatts per lumen. Um, and the recommendations are for sensitive materials not to exceed 10. Um, and to getting as close to zero as possible is, is best. Now, with UV, it's a little bit easier because we can't see UV. So if you completely take away the UV exposure, it doesn't do anything to the visitor experience. It looks the same to the visitor. So this is something that we can, you know, we can really easily come at this and say, okay, let's just knock that UV back to zero. Um, and our, our access is not diminished at all. Um, so if you are in a situation where you need more light, um, the easiest solution to that is to reduce the exhibition time. So we can look at putting very sensitive materials on display for much shorter periods of time. Perhaps they're only accessible for brief study viewing, or perhaps we have a very um, vigorous uh, rotation schedule in our galleries and display areas. You might consider when you're planning an exhibition that includes very light sensitive materials that you have kind of backups so that every month you can rotate something out and replace it with kind of a similar material um, in the same display case. And just to drive home that point again, the results of light damage are irreversible and quite um, quite noticeable and um, potentially devastating for collections materials. Um, this is a wool flag that was on permanent display and you can see the contrast between the color of the front that was displayed and the color of the back, which was protected from light. Um, this is a um, quill work um, basket, a small box. Um, birch bark with um, with quill embroidery and it is uh, the flowers were originally pink, um, which you can only see on the sides of the box in between, you know, in areas where the light didn't catch it. Um, so the, you know, the color is almost completely gone. And then light will have an even more devastating effect on silk um, because it causes not just fading, but it causes a chemical degradation of the, the physical nature of the proteins themselves. And if anyone has experienced shattered silk, which is a direct result of overexposure to light, you know that there's really no coming back from this. Um, it just causes the silk to become so weakened that it begins by tearing easily and ends in a pile of dust that's unrecognizable. There are light levels for all different types of materials. These are recommended light levels. And this is these are not just my recommendations. These are pretty universally accepted um, recommendations for different types of materials. Sometimes determining which category a material falls in is a little bit subjective, but, um, but the recommendations themselves have not changed significantly in the last 30 or 40 years and remain consistent. So those that most susceptible category, those very light sensitive materials that we want to keep under 50 lux 
um, includes, you know, textiles, cotton, wool, silk, natural fibers, most paper-based materials, although high quality paper with light stable inks, those, those can be in the next category. Those can be in category two and go up to a hundred lux. Um, organic based natural history specimens are in this very light sensitive category, as well as fugitive dyes and watercolors. Then if you're talking about materials that can withstand double the light exposure, um, we move into high quality paper, black and white um, photographs, and textiles with stable dyes. Someone asked me once how I can tell the difference between a textile with a stable dye and an unstable dye. And it is definitely, um, it is a good question. And I think it's something that you can really only say for certain once the damage has been done. But you can extrapolate that if the textile itself is relatively modern and in good condition, that the dyes are more likely to be stable. But if it's an older historic textile, if you can already see signs of light fading, um, or if you suspect plant dyes, um, then those would be um, unstable fugitive dyes. If you're a textile expert, you, um, you will probably be able to talk a lot about the mordant that's used to affix the dye to the, um, to the fiber, but I'm not a textile expert, so I'm afraid I just have to, um, to rely on kind of accumulated, accumulated knowledge from um, exposure to different types of collections. Um, and then moving into category three, this is where paintings live. So um, the recommended light levels are up to 200 lux for oil paintings, um, as well as bone, ivory, wood finishes, leather, and plastic. So this is going to be a lot of a lot of the collections materials in mixed collections. Um, and you'll find that even at 200 lux that this is going to be perhaps a challenge and you're, if you've got an exhibit designer on staff, they're going to, um, to resist you um, because these light levels are gonna be probably lower than what um, a designer would want um, and, and possibly lower than what you may be used to. Um, generally, like an office, in an office situation where you're gonna be doing a lot of reading or, um, or you know, that kind of work, uh, people like to have about 400 foot candles. I mean, sorry, 400 lux. So 200 is still gonna, it's gonna look a little, a little bit on the kind of mood lighting side of things. Um, but then the good news is that there's this whole category of materials that are not light sensitive at all. These are generally inorganic materials like metal, stone, glass, ceramics, um, most inorganic natural history specimens, archeological materials. Um, all of these materials are, are pretty much impervious to light. So if you have areas of your um, areas of your display where you simply you know don't have a lot of wiggle room with your um, with your with control of your lighting, this is where you can put your ceramics um, and your glass art and things like that. You'll see also on this graph that I've got two different columns for UV radiation. One of them is relative. That's the one on the far right, and one of them is absolute. Um, both of these numbers are important and are things to, uh, to, to potentially look at, and it, it's important that you be, you know, below the recommended guidelines in both of those. So then, what do we do to reduce light exposure in situations where our light levels are too high? Remember that the exposure is cumulative, and think about that concept of the total lux hours. So even if you have your lights up, um, if you have your lights up during opening hours, um, if you can turn them off when the space is closed or when no one is working in the space, that can limit the total cumulative exposure. Um, a lot of institutions are using motion sensors. If they have gallery spaces that um, are not staffed all the time, if you can put a motion sensing light in there, then when visitors enter the space, the light comes on. And after they leave, the light goes off. Um, and that can do a lot to really reduce the overall light levels, um, as well as getting UV filters for fluorescent bulbs. Um, fluorescent bulbs are a pretty notorious source of UV radiation, um, but if you just get, the filters are really easy to get and to install. They just look like kind of a textured sheet of plastic. Some of them, some UV lights come with the filters on them already, and those that don't, you can kind of easily put it on. Or you could switch out your, um, your display lighting to LEDs. LED is a great choice. It saves you um, energy as well as, um, as well as not having the, that UV component. 
Um, there are a lot of different ways you can utilize blinds or screens or shades to prevent natural light from entering your gallery spaces. There are a couple of examples shown here. Um, the one at the top shows uh, blinds that are pulled down um, during the sunny parts of the day. And then the other one shows a frosted glass block. So that's a more permanent solution. Um, those, you know, you can't pull those up on a cloudy day, for example. Um, although there's still a lot of UV on a cloudy day. Um, so, you know, be careful there. Um, but another thing to do is to apply UV film for your windows. And if you've got exterior windows in your, in your display areas or in your storage areas, especially, I really recommend putting UV film on them. Um, this film is easy to buy. It's easy to um, apply. You can apply it yourself or you can contact an installer to come and apply it for you. Um, it's come a long way in recent years and you can get a really um, a film that filters up to 95% of UV, but still looks clear. Um, I mean, if you have the film on one window and no film on the other window, you can kind of see a difference. One of them is like, it looks a little tinted, but if you've got film all over everything, you wouldn't know that there was any film there. Um, and then lastly, develop a rotation policy for your exhibition materials. That's probably the single most important thing. I don't recommend permanent display for any collections items. Um, display has carries with it a lot of hazards for collections materials, not just the light exposure, but there are also physical hazards, pollutant hazards, um, uh, risks posed by um, security um, that, uh, uh, that make it so that it really is if you have if you can if you can build a storage space or if you can include a storage space so that you can rotate items off of display regularly it will really do a lot to enhance their long term preservation. Um, here are the three major light technologies just kind of viewing them side by side, so you can see what I was talking about about the advantages of LED. So when we compare incandescent these are less and less common because they're so energy inefficient. Um, they, and they do have a little bit of UV output as well, as well as some IR output, and, and they can be pretty warm, um, which depending on your space could potentially be a fire hazard. Um, and then fluorescent lights are still very ubiquitous and very common, but um, the color rendering has improved, but it's still not great. Even in the, even at the best of times, it's, it's not fantastic. Um, and these do have a very high UV um, output although they're low heat and low IR. And then if you compare that with LED, the, these just kind of win on all counts. There's no UV, there's very low IR, there's no heat, they last longer. Um, the, the, I mean, the only, I think, disincentive is the expense at the outset, um, but they are great for collections. So how do you determine what your light levels are? Well, you have to take measurements. Um, and this is what I use. There are a lot of different light meters out there, but this is kind of the industry standard. Um, it's considered the most reliable and the most accurate. Um, it's the LSEC environmental monitor. This is the newest model, the 765. Um, and it is fairly pricey. Gaylord sells it for about $1,400. Um, there are grants that are available for purchasing this equipment. And you should also know that at the Midwest Art Conservation Center, we have a limited lending library of uh, monitoring equipment. So we have one of the 765 LSECs, and then we have two of the earlier model, the 764. And those are available for, um, for people to borrow. If you've got an exhibition coming up or you just want to know what your light levels are, um, you can just, send me an email and say, hey, send me a light meter. Um, they're actually all out right now, but I can put you on the waiting list um, and send you a light meter for when you can borrow it for up to three months um, and to kind of get a baseline sense and to become familiar with the tool and see if this is something that you want to purchase or if it's something that you could just you know, find a way to borrow when you need it. And this is how it's used. Um, again, so this small sensor here, this is the, let's actually, let's go back to the, to the larger picture. So this has, in fact, three different sensors on it. This is the visible light sensor right here, the small one. This is the UV sensor. It's actually a different sensor. It's a little bit larger. And this sensor here is for temperature and relative humidity. I don't use the LSAC for that. I have a more accurate way to measure temperature and relative humidity, but that's what the sensor is for. So know that that, you know, that is a component of this instrument. But when I'm using it, I'm really looking at these two sensors. And so when I'm taking light measurements, I'm really paying attention to that angle of incidence. I really want to, um, to come up against the artwork and, and, um, and, 
and kind of receive, have the, have this, have the LSEC receiving light in the same way that the artwork is receiving light to see what, what light levels is it, it's exposed to. And you can see reflected in this um, sensitive, light sensitive material is the fluorescent light um, in the hallway above it. And I don't know if you can see on the reading, but the Lux is 426. So that's, that's really high for uh, a light sensitive material. Um, you can also see, this was an intern of mine last year, Delena. She is taking measurements inside a display case that has its own lighting. So um, she's, she's reading it right now, but when she was taking the reading, she was actually holding it flat on the top of the books to see what light level the, the books themselves were being exposed to from this light here. Um, and these inside display case lights can be um, pretty sneaky because they don't always get turned off ever. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes they might be kind of an outdated lighting system. They might be those incandescents. They might have some UV. They might be fluorescence with UV. And they can put really, really strong directional light on the things that are closest to them. As you can see, these books, the tops of these books are getting a ton of light, whereas the books on the lower shelves are getting almost none. Um, so, you know, you might kind of ask yourself, well, you know, is this, what are the benefits of having this light on? Um, so when I do light readings, when I do it in a space, what I'll do is I'll enter a space and I'll kind of look for identifying the hot spots and the cool spots. So I'll look for, you know, where are the, the, the brightest areas and where are the darkest areas. And then I'll always take one in the center of the room just with the light meter facing up, just to kind of see like sort of overall ambient light. Um, but I take a lot of light readings in a given space. And I'm a little bit of a data nerd. Um, I do take for every light reading that I record, I take three readings and I average them together because so much changes depending on that angle of incidence. I find that it helps to sort of average three readings together. Um, that is That brings us kind of to the close of monitoring light. Before we move on to temperature and relative humidity, I wanted to give you guys a chance to ask any questions. How are we doing? Have any questions come through? Uh, no. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. All right. If you think of any, just go ahead and ask. Um, so moving on to temperature and relative humidity. Um, this slide shows a violin that was um, on permanent display in a collection that did not have environmental control at all. So there's no heating or cooling in the building. It was just... Um, um, fluctuated with the seasons. We got below freezing in the winter and got up into the 90s in the summer. Um, and it has taken its toll. The fretboard has popped off um, as well as, you know, kind of issues with the varnish. Um, this kind of temperature, fluctuating temperature extremes can be really, really hard on materials and cause all sorts of physical damage and distress. Nicole? Yeah. I do have a question. Go for it. Uh, is LED lumens the same as lumens for light? Yes. Yes, it is. Lumens are lumens regardless of the light source. That's the nice thing about the unit of the measuring units is that they're fairly consistent across. Good question. So um, incorrect temperature can cause degradation of materials, particularly for those that are displayed outdoors um, without the benefit of having environmental control, particularly for plastics and for organic materials. When I say organic, I don't mean organic in the way that they talk about at the grocery store. When I say organic, I mean um, collections materials that are derived from living systems. So they come from either plants or animals. So like wood, basketry, those come from plants, um, leather, for feathers, those come from animals. So those are kind of the organic materials. Inorganic materials come from the earth and they tend to be a lot more stable, both to light and to temperature and relative humidity because they came from outside to begin with. Um, but this shows, this example shows an outdoor sculpture in Birmingham, Alabama, um, where it gets really hot and there is no shade anywhere on this patio. And the sculpture itself was, is a fiberglass um, aluminum frame with fiberglass coating. And then it has this uh, clear coat over the top to um, protect the fiberglass. Uh, the clear coat was just a, an acrylic resin, I believe. 
And because of the just unrelenting heat and sunlight, this um, coating just completely broke down. And so this is it kind of blanching and flaking off of the surface. And you can see that it's just not, it's not long for this world um, as a direct result of the temperature extremes that to which it was exposed. Now, temperature and relative humidity have two different effects on collections materials. In general, what we can see with high temperatures is that they accelerate aging. So they accelerate the chemical reactions that are associated with degradation. Um, the chemical reactions that cause materials to break down over time include oxidation reactions, which is where they interact with oxygen to form different compounds, cross-linking, which is where um, chemical structures might kind of link together and become inflexible. This causes embrittlement and often yellowing as well. Acidification, which happens to paper materials um, over time, as well as photochemical reactions, such as the light fading that we see um, with exposure to light. So what I'm saying here is that these reactions may be happening on their own, but if you expose your material to high temperatures, they're gonna happen faster. So if you've got an artifact that's exposed to high light and it's slowly fading, it's gonna fade faster if the temperature is higher. So the temperature itself isn't necessarily doing anything that wasn't occurring on its own, it's just accelerating it. It's our, it's our accelerated ager. Humidity changes, on the other hand, do have a direct effect. They have physical effects on materials that, are, that, that absorb and release moisture like a sponge. And this is pretty much every organic material, anything that comes from a living system, either a plant or an animal, is going to have this capacity to some degree or another to kind of absorb moisture in, um, in high humidity situations to become soft, pliable, a little bit larger, and then to shrink down and to dry when that relative humidity drops down. So remember that sponge analogy, because it's a really good one to kind of think of with your collections materials. Now with relative humidity, that is not, um, not ideal or not what we're looking for. Some materials are gonna be more vulnerable than others. And in particular, the vulnerable materials are gonna be those that are less dense and more porous, more able to kind of expand and contract like the sponge does. Um, wood is a little bit of an exception because wood itself is so hard and durable, but, um, but because of the way that wood is used in complex structures like furniture, um, and especially in laminated structures like with the veneer or in marquetry, um, those thin layers of wood can especially expand and contract. Um, and expand and contract in different ways um, from one another, which can cause a lot of physical stress during changing relative humidities. Textiles, leather and hide, basketry, taxidermy collections are also quite susceptible to relative humidity changes and paintings too. And with paintings, a lot of it is because it's that laminated structure. You've got a varnish, a paint layer, a ground layer, um, a support, which is usually either textile or a wooden support in the case of panel paintings, then maybe a stretcher, maybe a frame also. You know, there are just so many different materials close together and they all might be responding differently to relative humidity changes. Um, here's some examples of what paper looks like when it's wet. Um, paper is very ubiquitous in collections, particularly libraries and archives, and there is lots of it out there in the world. Um, and I think we're all probably familiar with the way that paper looks when it's wet. It often gets a little cockled, feels a little softer, sometimes has a characteristic smell. Um, if the paper is restrained, like this print is on the back, you can see that it is glued to its frame. Um, then the, that restraint will inhibit movement during the swelling as it absorbs moisture and also the contraction when it shrinks down again. And this can cause damage. We see this not just in paper, but we also see it in wood. Um, it's why some of the, the highest um, craftsmanship uses only wooden joinery and not metal hardware because metal hardware provides a restraint for the wood that is, doesn't allow for that expansion and contraction and changing relative humidities. And often the result is the wood will split or crack along the restraint. Um, dry conditions will also have an effect on paper. 
uh, particularly relative humidity that's below 20%. So this leads to the loss of what's called bound water. And there's this little schematic here to kind of illustrate. If you imagine this is your paper, um, and this is kind of free water that's floating around in between your molecules of cellulose. Cellulose is the building block of paper. And then here are your little cellulose molecules. And at the end of each cellulose molecule, there's actually a, a, a bound water molecule at the end here. And this is part of what gives paper its physical properties. It's part of what makes it supple and soft and have that nice hand feel. Um, so when we talk about the loss of bound water, we're talking not just about the water that goes in between the molecules, but the water that's part of the paper itself. And what happens when we lose that bound water is you get permanent dimensional change. Your paper is going to start to look different than it did before. It's going to be cockled. It's going to have a different surface texture. Its, its visual characteristics will change. So this is kind of like the drop dead point. Like we don't want to get our collections environment below 20% relative humidity, especially if we have a lot of paper, it's just too dry. Um, but what we also don't want is we don't want fluctuations. We don't want humidity to go up and down. We like to find a stable level that our environmental systems can maintain and keep it there. Because when we fluctuate up and down and up and down, even if we're within a reasonable band, um, that, that the very fluctuation itself can cause that kind of differential swelling and shrinking between materials, especially layered structures. And this is ultimately what causes crack allure, cracking on paints, on painted surfaces, like what you see here. Um, it's, it's those humidity fluctuations. So, so this slide shows, um, what are the current international guidelines that have been established by the museum community for both temperature and relative humidity? Um, uh, it used to be, you may have heard of the 50-70 rule. Um, it used to be 50% relative humidity, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That was kind of the rule for collections. This was always a compromise and it was always a little bit arbitrary and it was too restrictive. It didn't take into account regional variations or um, frankly, the ability of institutions with different size budgets to be able to, um, to maintain those kinds of levels. So in an effort um, to be more realistic and also more environmentally conscious, the museum community has expanded those guidelines um, for better or for worse. And so they are, as you see them here, the relative humidity is recommended between 45 and 55%, plus or minus 5%. So that actually takes us to a working range of 40 to 60. Um, with temperature guidelines between 59 and 77. And if you're wondering why those numbers are a little off, yes, they were adapted from Celsius. Um, and then just to um, you know, define relative humidity for you, it is the, it's the ratio of the amount of water vapor that's present in the air to the greatest amount possible at that same temperature. So remember that warmer air has the capacity to hold more moisture than colder air. More will fit in the air. Um, and then you may also hear the related term dew point. Um, we hear this a lot when talking about temperature and the way that, um, like, the, you, like the weather, when talking about the weather, the dew point can really affect the way, how a temperature feels. And the dew point is the temperature at which the humidity in the air will begin to condense kind of a way of talking about absolute moisture content in the air instead of the relative humidity. Um, and the way that this can help us when thinking about collections is that an elevated dew point compared with exterior conditions can indicate um, a moisture incursion to an enclosed space. So if you're looking at a room that has a higher dew point than another room, then there's, there's somehow moisture coming in from outside. Um, and that can be kind of a clue to you to look at your building envelope. Um, but Basically, the takeaway here is 45 to 50% relative humidity with a temperature between 59 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, when I talk about establishing set points, what I'm talking about is a couple of different things. I'm talking about the target, the target temperature and relative humidity that you're aiming for in your facility in collections areas. So this is in exhibition areas, in storage areas and in areas where artwork is processed. So if you have like a framing area or an unpacking area or something like that, this goes for that space as well. Um, now, environmental set points from an HVAC perspective can sometimes also mean 
the point at which the system will kick in to change it. So you might have a temperature set point of, say in the summertime, you might have your lower set point at, um, you know, say 72. So when it gets above 72 degrees, your HVAC system detects it and says, oh, let's turn on the cool air. Let's get back below 72. Um, and then in the winter, you might have a set point that's like 68, you know, so when it gets, okay, those, those are really narrow, 68 to 72 is a very narrow range, but just for the sake of argument, your lower set point might be 68. So when the temperature drops below 68, that's the indication to the, your HVAC system to turn on, turn the heat on so that the heat will go on. So these set points are very, have a very specific function in terms of the terminology that your facilities department is going to be using. Um, let's see, it is just about three o'clock. Um, let me do one more slide. No, let's not do that slide yet. Why don't we take a little break right now? Um, if you guys have any questions, now is a good time for them. Um, and if not, we could just go straight to a little stretch break. How are we doing? No questions yet. Okay. Any questions. Okay. Well, let's just take, um, how long do you guys want? Five minutes? Say my clock says 2.56, come back at 3.01, uh, get some coffee, stand up, do a jumping jack, and then come back. Okay. Sounds good to me. I'll see you here. All right. Thank you. How's it going? You guys back? So as you kind of come back in, I was looking over the um, participant list and I noticed that we have someone from Alaska, Bethany. You're in Alaska? I can't hear you, of course, but you could say hi in the chat. Yes, she says yes. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was thinking, okay, yeah, great, cool. Glad you could join. One of the things that's been so, um, so well, the only thing that's been good about the pandemic and the you know, enhanced Zoom accessibility is the, that we've been able to reach people from all over. Um, and I've got a colleague that I've been working with quite a bit in Hawaii and she's like, wow, you know, we're so isolated out here. This is just really great. Um, so I hope you've been able to benefit from that a little bit too. Um, yes, good, glad to hear it. I am going to keep sharing if anyone thought of any questions while they were on break. Let me know, except now I can't see the chat anymore now that I'm sharing my screen. So you'll have to do it in the Q&A place. Uh, oh, I wonder if I, I bet I can, oh, hang on, let me open, I bet I can open the chat. Um, oh yeah, I can. Okay, so I can see the chat if you wanna post a message there. Um, okay, so establishing set points, slide number two. Whose responsibility is this? Um, so on this picture, you will see a bunch of people talking about the HVAC system and the environment, temperature and relative humidity. You'll see the museum director, a facilities manager. Um, I work with a lot of collections that, are, um, that have a relationship with their municipality. So sometimes they're operating out of a building that might actually be owned by the city and managed by the city. So that's why that person from Public Works is in that meeting talking to the preservation assessor who is looking at the original building plans and talking about um, you different air handling units and different capacities of different spaces. Um, you may also, if part of you, if if part of you, if some of you are part of um, a university or a large umbrella institution like that, you might find that you um, that you have facilities specialists who are completely unrelated to your department or even your building that you're needing to liaise with and to communicate about the importance of having um, environmental control over your spaces and that that environmental control is a little bit different for collection spaces than it is for general operations or, or regular ordinary use. Um, so in that sense, it can be, um, education can be really important. I actually am having, um, 
a consultation meeting with a university museum collections manager and uh, two members of the university facilities department, facilities staff to go over exactly this kind of stuff, to talk to them about the specifics for uh, museum environments and museum collections. Um, there is a fantastic resource that um, I might, um, I have your email addresses, so I might go ahead and, and send it as like a follow-up resource. Um, it's from, it's the ASHRAE standard, the American Society of Heating Engineer. Uh, it's basically the HVAC Specialist Society. Um, and they have uh, the chapter 24 of their latest standard is about museums, galleries, libraries, and archives, and what, um, what facilities engineers need to know about collections environments. And it's really, really super technical but it's really great. So if you, um, if you work with people who uh, would be um, kind of, what's the word, receptive or interested in that kind of stuff, I can send that out to you and you can share it with them. Um, and so then, you know, there's also the conservation assessor, someone like me who might be coming in and say, looking at your collection saying, okay, this is, you know, these are my recommendations. But ultimately the person who is really responsible for establishing set points is gonna be the person who's in charge of the collection, who I assume, to some degree or another is you, you who are attending this workshop, um, that ultimately, ultimately it's the, it's, it's the person who's in charge of the collection who needs to take input from all of these other different voices and to kind of synthesize them and come up with what the, what the goals are for your facility. Um, so when you're meeting with various people um, in your organization or without, some questions to ask are how many air handling units do we have in our facility? You may just have one, you may have 20 or 30. Um, and which units include the collection storage and display areas? Is that one specific unit? What else is on that unit? Specifically, is there an exterior doorway included with that unit? Because an exterior doorway is going to you know, cause a lot of um, potential fluctuation in the temperature and relative humidity of the air, because uh, you know it's allowing that outside air to come in. So, so um, finding out what AHU you're on and what else is on that AHU is really important. Also, finding out if your HVAC system includes humidification and dehumidification. Many do, and that is super fantastic, but many don't, especially in older buildings, they probably don't. Um, but it can be possible to add it, especially if, you're, if your collections area is only on one AHU. There are some um, systems that are amenable to just having humidification and dehumidification added to a single unit. It doesn't necessarily have to be a system overhaul. Um, sometimes you can't add it. Sometimes you're, um, your HVAC system is too outdated to be able to accommodate that, in which case, what are what is your long term vision for your facility and is this an upgrade that you're working towards and if so make sure that all of the players who are involved with orchestrating that kind of. Um, uh, uh, an upgrade understand that that this is something that your collection needs is this humidification and dehumidification built into the system. Um, you also want to ask if you can program in set points. So like I was talking about a couple of slides ago, if you can say, okay, when the relative humidity gets to 45, or when the, say when the relative humidity gets to 40%, then the humidification system needs to kick in and it needs to bring that up. Or conversely, when the relative humidity gets to 60%, the dehumidification system needs to kick in and dry that air back down and bring it back. So you're staying within those recommended guidelines. Um, if you do have set points that are programmed in, what happens when there's an incursion? Does the system automatically adjust in order to meet the requirements? Or is there some kind of an alarm? Is someone notified and someone has to manually make a change? And if so, do they actually do that? I've certainly been to institutions where, you know, the dehumidification alarm has been going off all three months of the summer and everyone just keeps kind of turning it off and saying, oh yeah, that's been going off. It's good to know what happens when the alarm goes off and to make sure that uh, the right people are being notified. And if you're not on that list, if someone from the collections department isn't on that list, you should be, you should know when incursions are happening. 
Um, keep in mind also when you're having these conversations about set points and the museum environment that human comfort is important. And remember when I talked about how um, increased temperature increases degradation, most materials do better at cooler temperatures, but people don't like them. People don't like to visit museums that are really cold and you don't want your exhibition space to feel like the Hotel of Ice in Romania. So, so compromises need to be made in order to, um, to make the space welcoming and inviting for your visitors. Um, some materials deteriorate really quickly at room temperature, like modern plastics, rubber, color photographs, magnetic tape, and these would all benefit from cooler temperatures. Um, if you have a separate storage environment for your collections and you can keep that several degrees cooler than your exhibition spaces or your working spaces, that can be very beneficial. If you can also um, arrange for, I mean, not very many museums have these kinds of resources, but if you can arrange for having cold temperature storage, in your facility um, that can also be really prolong the life of those materials. Um, keep in mind also that adhering to very strict guidelines can put historic structures at risk. So if your, um, if your building itself is part of your collection, if you're in a historic house, um, and, and if this is you know, one of your collections items that need to be maintained, you need to take that into consideration. Um, this is Drayton Hall in South Carolina, and the decision that they made, this building was never electrified and it never had a heating system put in. Um, so it, it has been, you know, kind of, it, it has been maintained at its historic state. Um, and in order to protect the collections, the, the um, Drayton Hall made the decision to move the collections out of the original house and they have a separate gallery that's on the property but it's a separate building, it's a new facility, it has temperature and relative humidity control, and all of the collections items are in there, but then visitors can still walk through the house, and the house is still um, is maintained in this very holistic way where um, the, the, the guides or the guards will go through and they will open windows and close doorways to kind of improve airflow when the sun is shining in one space or when it's cold outside to kind of manage manage the house much the way that a family living in it would have um, in times before we had environmental control. Um, and those are certainly, that's kind of an extreme situation, but options like that are available for, um, for buildings for which um, having very tight temperature and humidity control would cause damage to the structure itself. What happens is that these older buildings, they don't necessarily have the vapor barriers in place. So if you try to maintain a constant temperature relative humidity, you can cause water condensation to build up inside the walls, which can create issues with mold and potentially you know, um, structural issues as well. Know your climate zone. Um, I think that most of you, uh, with the exception of our Alaskan participant, are going to be in four or five, um, and which is, let's see, it is, um, it's neither warm nor cold. It's pretty, I can't remember what the name of that zone is, but this is, um, you know, this is something that is going to affect the type of HVAC system that is going to be in your building and the type of buildings that are that the materials that are used to build your structures. So what you're going to find is that you have winters where it does get down below freezing, but maybe not for as many days of the year as it's going to in six or seven. Um, so your HVAC systems are not going to be called upon to um, to meet those heating demands in the same way as they will be farther north. And again, call, not not um, as not as many demands upon them in terms of cooling in the hotter months as well, but you are still going to see some pretty serious fluctuations from summer to winter. Um, it's not a temperate zone by any means. It can be more difficult to control relative humidity than temperature, and the two are interrelated. Um, so remember when I was talking about how temperature increases the rate at which reactions recur, but relative humidity can cause materials to expand and contract? So imagine that you know there are some there are some physical effects that occur at at higher temperatures, and then if you also have higher humidity, those effects are going to occur more quickly. 
So the two things are interrelated and kind of compound on one another. Um, but I would argue that controlling relative humidity is actually the more important of the two in terms of preservation of museum artifacts. And one of the big reasons for that is mold. Um, so mold is something that, you know, we really want to avoid in our collections. It can happen very quickly and it can be devastating. Um, the slide here is a, from a book called Mold is Beautiful. So the National Library of France had a mold incursion in their modern, um, modern photographs collection. And the curator decided to look on the bright side of things and photograph the damage that the mold caused and published a book about it. So what you're looking at here is, um, so this is the original photograph, which shows this wildfire. And then these areas here, this is, um, this is water damage. So the image is created in, um, in a gelatin layer that's water soluble. So when this gets really, really wet um, and then dries out, it kind of, it shrinks and cracks. And the white that you're seeing is the white of the paper support underneath. And then this area here, this dark area here, this is mold staining. So this is mold. It, it looks to me because of this line here, like there was maybe another object on top of this and the moisture kind of stayed in here and the mold was just allowed to grow. So mold staining can be reduced by conservation, but often not removed completely. Um, and once an object has suffered mold damage, it's always going to be it's always going to be um, increasingly susceptible to mold in the future. Mold occurs at relative humidity is greater than 65% after just 72 hours. So this is another reason why monitoring your collection environment and knowing when you have incursions outside of your set points is really important. So if you're having relative humidity above 65%, you need to know right away so that you can get in and you can bring that RH back down and prevent mold from growing in your collection. Um, this just says, this um, slide shows some images of different types of mold on different types of things. Here's some molds on paper, mold on a basket, mold on vinyl, uh, more mold on paper. This is probably what I see most commonly is this kind of scattered dark gray splotches. It almost looks like dirt at first. Here are some fun facts about mold. The most common ones are the three pictured here, Cladosporium, Penicillium, and Aspergillus. Um, they are, um, uh, yeah, what can I say? Um, they're, they're moldy. Uh, you may have heard of black mold. This is a very specific species of mold, Stachyborus, I think is what it's called. And it has a really bad rap, but it's not the only black mold. There are a lot of other molds that are black. And honestly, the toxicity dif differences between the molds are fairly minimal. All molds cause increased prevalences of respiratory symptoms, including allergies and asthma. This is the World Health Organization that's saying this. This is not some fly by night. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a reputable group of scientists who are discussing and very seriously the health, um, health consequences of being subjected to mold. So in addition to the fact that it's disfiguring to your collection, it's also a human health hazard. So it's definitely something that you want to avoid having in your collection. Um, so you want to keep your relative humidity levels below that 65%. And if we can below 60, that's that recommended guideline. That's to kind of give us a buffer. So mold thrives in dank, dark, still spaces um, that are also wet. So you can also minimize mold. Um, if you find that you're at that kind of borderline and you're a little worried in the summertime, maybe your collections get a little humid, you can promote air circulation by using a fan. You can turn on lights. If your collections are in boxes, <laughs> turn on lights to prevent you know, the spread of mold. So you know, there are kind of little things that you can do to kind of give yourself a little, a little help there. Um, but keeping your um, environmental controls below 60% um, below and especially below 65 is really key. So a note about compromise, um, different materials have different requirements. And you may find that if your collection, it consists of mainly inorganic materials that you have a little bit more flexibility. Um, you know, we have to balance the preservation of our artifacts against the preservation of our historic structures. 
and be mindful of the buildings themselves um, and always be willing to take input from um, preservation architects and assessors who may be um, educating us about the limitations of our buildings. Um, Artifact preservation versus public access is always kind of a little bit of a dance. As a conservator, um, I have some professional obligations to argue for the preservation of artifacts, but I'm also a conservator who believes that objects don't mean anything if no one can see them. So public accessibility is really, really important and finding, um, finding a compromise, finding a balance between preservation and access is really the ultimate goal of um, collections care. Um, artifact preservation versus, versus the limits of the HVAC technology and building materials that we're working with is also a compromise that may need to be made. And that's where you can work with the other specialists um, who know your building and know your systems to kind of figure out what your limitations are. And then preservation versus the budget. Um, we all have to make budgetary compromises and we can dream about what perfect HVAC system we would like to have. And then we can also kind of get to work and work with the one that we do have and see what sorts of changes we can make that will um, enable us to, to kind of do the best that we can. One way that a lot of institutions have found to handle this is seasonal drift. So what this is, is making in incremental adjustments to the temperature and relative humidity throughout the year. Um, understanding that it can be difficult to maintain higher humidity levels in the winter and difficult to maintain lower humidity levels in the summer. So establishing a gradual change that is intentional over several months in the spring and in the fall. So, um, so in the winter, your relative humidity might be closer to 40. And then um, as you move into the spring months, you gradually and incrementally bring it up so that it's um, you know, closer to 55 or 60 in the summer, and then gradually bring it back down again in the fall. Um, so um, generally what we see in, in, the, in climate zones where you have very significant seasonal changes is that in the summer, the relative humidity will go up increased risk of mold and that you may, if your HVAC system isn't up to the task, you may want to employ dehumidifiers locally as well as fans. Whereas in the winter, you might see that your relative humidity is dropping down. That typically starts to happen as soon as the heat goes on because the heaters are drying out your air. If you don't have humidification built into your HVAC system, you're gonna see a big relative humidity drop in the winter. Um, and what this can mean for your artifacts is you might find that they feel a little bit different. Your basketry items might get a little bit stiffer and be more brittle. They're going to be more susceptible to breakage and damage. And if that relative humidity gets too low, you're going to start to see planar deformations in paper. Um, we, at, in the, in the, when I used to work in the objects lab, we would always have this very sad little parade of cracked wooden artifacts that would come in every November. People would say, I don't know what happened. It just cracked. And I was like, I know what happened. Your heat went on in your house. That's what happened. Um, and we can manage this with local humidifiers, room humidifiers as well. So keeping in mind that what we're targeting is to make the environment as stable as possible. We're giving our collections a buffer from what's happening outside. And that buffer is provided not just by a fancy HVAC system, but it's also provided by our building enclosure and by our museum cases and our storage cabinets and our you know, uh, individual housings. If you have a lot of humidity fluctuations in your storage area, one thing that you can, one thing you can do to combat that is to provide you know, um, acid-free board housings for your artifacts. And that gives a little bit of a humidity buffer. Um, but if you're wanting to add some kind of a, uh, some equipment, you can dehumidify locally with dehumidifiers in the summer. And now you're targeting getting below that 60%. Here are some images of some local room humidifiers. Um, this one is really great because <laughs> you see, so you can, if you're not familiar with um, dehumidifiers, some of them will come with a pan. So it's pulling moisture out of the air and that moisture collects in a pan, which you then have to empty. Um, which is a little bit of a pain because that pan, depending on what, how much humidity you've got, that pan could get full really quickly. So I usually recommend if it has some kind of um, a hose like this, so it's draining into a drain or into a sink 
So this is the collection storage area and here's the hose and they've actually got it going up the wall. They drilled a hole in the wall and it's going through and into the next room and into a sink, which I thought was pretty brilliant. Um, so, so they've made that work. Um, if you are getting one that does have a pan, you do need to monitor it really carefully. It'll just automatically shut off as soon as the pan is full. It's not like you have to worry about the pan overflowing or anything, but I can tell I had a data logger in a space once um, is the kind that I could read remotely. And I could see when the pan got full because the humidity just like went up. And then I could see when the collections caretaker came in and emptied the pan because it came down and it was just this like up and down, up. And I was like, that's not the stability that we're aiming for. So if you can get one that drains, that would be great. And then you could, oh, one more thing about um, uh, local dehumidifiers. There was recently a really big recall on a bunch of dehumidifiers. So if you're using one, look up the recall and make sure that the one that you're using isn't on the list. It included a whole host of dehumidifiers manufactured in the last five years. Um, so if you've got an older one, you don't have to worry, but um, that's definitely something to pay attention to. Um, similarly, there, is, there are humidifiers that you can get for the winter. Basically, these are, you know, fancy pans of water that are, you know, uh, blowing moisture out into your space. Um, if you're using a humidifier, consider putting an air purifier on that too. That can help with pollutant mitigation. Make sure that you keep your artifacts a safe distance away from this. They do have a tendency to create a localized area of high humidity right above them before it kind of distributes and monitor it for condensation, especially if you're in a lower temperature space. Um, and then if you can rotate this around your space, that'll provide more even humidification. Also make sure to check the filters regularly. And then um, we've got a bunch of different ways that we can measure relative humidity. This is what I use when I go into collections areas and I'm taking spot readings. Um, this is called a psychrometer, which um, psychrometry is the study of moist air. Who knew there was a whole field of study devoted to this, but this is essentially, and here it is, this is what it looks like closed and here it is open. It's just, um, it's just two thermometers. This is called the dry bulb. This is just measuring the temperature of the air. And then this is called the wet bulb. You see, it's got this little cotton sock on it. And I add water to the sock and I turn on this fan and it blows air across them. And so what it's measuring, what's happening here is that the water is evaporating from the sock. And we've all noticed that when water evaporates on our skin, we feel cooler. Um, the thermometer also feels cooler. So it's gonna measure a cooler temperature relative to the dry bulb. Um, and that, that temperature lowering effect is directly related to how much moisture is actually in the air already. So if it's really, really humid, this, the moisture in the sock doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, but if it's really, really dry, that it's gonna evaporate really fast and bring that temperature down quickly. So the reason I mention this is because early definitions of relative humidity actually define it as the difference between a dry bulb and a wet bulb. So ergo, this is the most accurate by definition way to measure relative humidity. So that's what I use. Um, there's, so this is, this is um, a regular psychrometer. This is another type of psychrometer called a sling psychrometer. Instead of having a fan, you kind of whirl it around, um, but it's essentially the same. It has two bulbs. Here's the dry bulb and here's the wet bulb with the sock. This is actually a scene at a party at my house where Maddie and I got out our sling psychrometers and started comparing them. Um, it's what conservators do for fun. So this is kind of what it looks like. You know, kind of spin it around. Um, I have a, I actually have a, um, a historic one. So it's like brass and it has a long string and I wouldn't use it in the collection because the string is so long. It's like, you don't want to hit anything, but anyway, enough of that. Um, so the, what the psychrometer tells us, it doesn't actually, it, has, it would be too easy for it to tell us what the relative humidity is. It tells us the dry bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature. And then we have to figure out the relative humidity by looking at this complex chart, the psychrometric chart. Um, so bear with me, it's worth it, I swear. Uh, down here, we've got our dry bulb temperature here. This is the temperature of the room. And then up here on this curved line, we have the wet bulb temperature. So if I was looking at my wet bulb and I saw that it was 70 degrees, I'm gonna follow this line. This is the wet bulb line. The yellow lines are the wet bulb. So if my wet bulb is 70 and my dry bulb is 80, 
I'm gonna follow the blue and see where the blue and the yellow meet. And they meet right here at this spot. And then I'm gonna see what the red is. The red is the relative humidity. And at that point, it's 60%. So wet bulb of 70, dry bulb of 80 corresponds to 60% relative humidity. So that's how we would use um, a chart like this to determine what the relative humidity of our collections is. So there's a specific region of this chart that's important, okay? This is the region where the temperature is between 59 and 77 degrees and the relative humidity is between 40 and 60%, right? Do you remember those numbers? These are our internationally recognized guidelines for collections care. So we want all of our readings of temperature and relative humidity to fall right in this zone. This is the happy area. You might see this chart. You might hear reference to this chart. Um, if you ever have me come and do an assessment, I'll probably share images of this chart. Um, and here's an example of how we can use our collections data to give us information using this chart. So this is a random gallery space. Every blue dot um, is a measurement of, um, of temperature and relative humidity that uh, was taken over the course of a year. So this is a year's worth of data in this space. And if we overlay our um, recommended levels, we can see how much of the time our environment is not adhering to the guidelines that we're setting for it. So you can, you can use visual data like this to make an argument for your, um, for your director to put in a new HVAC system. Um, you, can use, you can use this to kind of understand better what your issues are. Um, there's another way to look at, um, to determine relative humidity from dry bulb and wet bulb, and it's looking at the psychrometric chart in table form. So this has the dry bulb temperature over here. This is just 61 to 80 degrees. Um, this is a pretty big chart. So I'm just showing you a section of it. And then here's the wet bulb temperature over here. Um, and then the red number is the relative humidity. So if you want to know where our target zone is, it's right there. So as long as our readings are falling in that range, we're pretty happy. Although we don't wanna to fluctuate too much even within the range. Um, other ways to measure relative humidity include these humidity indicator cards. Um, these are really inexpensive. Um, so in that sense, they're good and you can put them wherever you want. Um, so, um, they're reusable, they're easy to use, they're small enough that you can put it in a frame package or an exhibit case. Um, they don't require batteries or software, but, um, so I say that they're easy to use and I also say that they're difficult to read. I, I have, I have some issues with these because I feel like it's like you're supposed to you're supposed to measure like where the change from pink to blue is, but I feel like that happens over several. Um, I, I just don't find them as easy to use as some other people do. I find it a little ambiguous. Um, but the big um, the big issue is that it doesn't keep it doesn't keep records for you. This is just a spot reading. It just tells you what the um, what the relative humidity is at the moment that you're looking at it, which is true for the psychrometer that I was talking about too. Um, so that you could also use uh, thermohygrometers. There's um, the kind of analog version on the left, and then there's the digital version on the right. Um, these are pretty, these are relatively inexpensive. Now, none of these are gonna be as accurate as the psychrometer that I use, and they're all gonna require calibration. I have several of the R10 um, hygrometers, and I calibrate them before I use them every time um, because they, they'll drift, they'll drift over a couple of weeks even. Um, and the way that I calibrate them is with my psychrometer. So they've got a little like a screw in the back. So you can, um, you know, if you take a measurement with the psychrometer and say, okay, it's supposed to be 55% relative humidity. And then you like turn the screw and it'll change the needle until it's where you want it to be. Um, these are still, however, relatively inexpensive, minimal training required. These are very easy to read. Um, they're small and unobtrusive, um, but again, no records kept and they have to be calibrated. So this is actually what I recommend, is these data loggers, and there are lots of different kinds of them. Um, the um, hobos are, um, I think, ones that a lot of people are familiar with. 
The PEM2 data loggers from IPI are pretty great, although you should know if you don't already that they are no longer making these or selling them and will soon no longer support them either. So the PEM2s are soon to be a thing of the past. Um, Conserve is a relatively new company. They um, are um, designed specifically for collections care. So unlike Hobo, which markets to all types of all different kinds of industries, Conserve is really about collections. So they have really good customer support. Um, the advantages of having a data logger like this, like the biggest advantage is that this is going to monitor, this is going to take readings over a period of time. So, and it, it, it records and analyzes your data. So you're going to be able to see what's going on in your galleries, like at any moment in time. Um, they have real-time alerts that are built into them. So they can, you know, kind of send you a message to your email or to your phone if you, you know, go above or below um, a specific level that you can set. With many of them, not all of them, but with many of them and more and more of them, you can monitor the data remotely over the internet. So like I have an app on my phone and I can check what the relative humidity is in, you know, wherever my sensor is um, whenever I want, which is really great. Um, they do tend to be more expensive and the price varies depending on what features you're getting with it um, up to between 150 and about 350 for each device or conserve uses a subscription service so they're uh, I think they start at $40 a month for two two data loggers and then it kind of goes up from there. Um, there's a little bit of a learning curve, um, learning the software getting the software installed and they still have to be recalibrated. The nice thing about the subscription services is that they'll just send you a new one. Um, you don't have to send it away. They'll just, they just tell you when it needs to be recalibrated. So that's an advantage. And here's a little bit of a look at what the data looks like. So this is data using the Conserve um, software. And you can, uh, the Conserve software is free to use for anybody. You can sign up for a free account and you can import your hobo information or your PIM2 information. You can look at information from any logger on this conserved software. So this is freely available to any of you um, and really easy to use. Um, I think their software is really fantastic. But so what we're looking at, what we're looking at on a chart like this, the temperature is given in um, the dark blue and relative humidity is given in the red. Um, and this is for, it looks like two months, October and November of 2020. Um, in a particular space in a in gallery 298, it looks like. Um, and what what we can see is that um, you know oftentimes the temperature and relative humidity will kind of mirror each other. When the temperature goes up, the relative humidity will go down and vice versa. Um, but this can give you a real sense of what the levels are doing over time. Um, and Another thing that you can do with the conserved data is you can overlay your seasonal temperature. So if you plug in your address, it'll it'll take the the um, temperature and humidity data from the you know from the internet and it'll plug it in and show you that graph also. So you'll be able to say, oh, that's when we had that big like cold snap and the heat went on. Remember back in November, and you'll be able to just see it on the chart, which is really cool. Um, what I generally recommend for people who are just starting environmental monitoring is to collect data for a full year and then kind of sit down and analyze it and see what your seasonal trends, because what your trends are, because you'll learn a lot from that full cycle of the seasons. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about today are is, uh, uh, the final aspect of um, the collections environment is pollutants. Um, before we move on to that though, does anyone have any questions about monitoring temperature, relative humidity? I've got the chat up. So if you wanna ask it in the chat, I'll be able to see you. Nicole, you mentioned the one uh, resource that you were uh, going to send out to us. Does that, uh, go specifically into issues of historic buildings and historic structures too? I think it does a little bit. I'm trying to remember. Um, I, I, you know, I think it just touches on it briefly. I don't think it goes into a lot of detail about historic structures now, but there is, if that's something that you guys are requesting, I think I, I feel like I, there's a resource out there that's like at the tip of my brain that I, I'm sure I will think of as soon as the workshop is over and I can send that out to you. That would be great. Okay. 
Um, oh, which kind of vlogger would I currently recommend? Um, oh, you have the IPIs. Okay, so let me tell you. Um, so I'm a, I, I can't specifically endorse one logger over another. And honestly, this is, they're, they're pretty simple devices. A lot of them are going to be great. You're going to be happy with whichever one you choose. But I will say that the Conserve company has a promotion right now where if you trade in your um, IPI loggers with them, they'll give you like a huge discount on your first year subscription. <laughs> And so this is part of this actually super awesome trade-in program. So what they're doing is they're asking people to trade in their old loggers, not just the PEM 2s, but any old loggers if they want to upgrade to conserve. So they give those institutions a discount and then they take those used loggers and they give them to me. And I give them to institutions that need loggers for free. <laughs> so it's this, I mean, they don't just give them to me. They give them to like regional um, distributors throughout the country. They're doing a pilot program in Minnesota um, where they're, you know, trying to like promote collections care by, you know, giving secondhand loggers to institutions that wouldn't be able to afford to buy their own loggers. So I'm a huge supporter of that program, which, um, so I, I like the conserve loggers a lot. Um, I like, but more than the loggers, I like the software. I think that, um, I think that if you prefer not to do a subscription service and you prefer just to buy the loggers outright, a hobo logger that has um, a Wi-Fi that communicates with Wi-Fi, I would recommend, but I would use the conserve software with it. But it might just be, it might be just as easy to use the conserve loggers. Um, so oftentimes people are buying environmental monitoring with grant money. There are a lot of grants that are available to support this. And I think people are a little confused by the subscription model that Conserve has, but what I recommend is if you are applying for a grant and like the NEH PAG grant, which I think is due January 13th, or maybe it's the November one, might be the November deadline, um, which supports environmental monitoring equipment. If you put in, if, if you like give an estimate for like the next seven years, like what a subscription would cost you for the next seven years, that's a good way to still kind of get that grant money for the environmental monitoring without having to actually purchase the monitor itself. Uh, oh Yes, Claire and Melissa are awesome with Conserve. They are, yes. Conserve has actually hired two preventive conservators specifically to work with um, collections managers to get them, you know, kind of training that they need to monitor their collections to be using their loggers successfully. And so that there, I, I really, I can't say enough good things about their customer support. That's really fantastic. Um, okay. I didn't do very, a very good job of not endorsing a product, did I? There, the, the hobo loggers are good too. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, the Museum of Evolutions is using Conserve. Is it working okay? Have you had experience with it? They're, they're, they've made, um, they're really growing. They started just a few years ago. They're based out of Birmingham, Alabama, and they've, um, they're, they're growing really fast. They just started the spring. Okay, cool. Um, but let's talk about pollutants next. So the materials that are going to be vulnerable to pollutants um, are, all materials are to a certain degree or another, but particularly your metal artifacts. Um, and what we're seeing here is a bronze sculpture that was exposed to, um, um, what is it called? Uh, water deposits, hard water deposits, because it was getting splashed from a nearby fountain. And that's what the white incrustations are. So that's kind of an extreme example. But common sources of pollution include poor quality air from an HVAC unit, um, off-gassing from display case materials, like wooden, wooden display case materials, off-gassing from nearby artifacts, like the bookmark in this book here, you can see the, um, the two different papers have extremely different paper quality. So the bookmark is a low quality, highly acidic paper that is then transferring those acids into the higher quality um, paper of the book. Museum dust, which comes from your visitors and finger oils from handling, as you can see on the copper in the lower right. Here are some limits for air pollutants above these concentrations, and you will see corrosion of metal objects. So sulfur dioxide, sulfur is, is, um, is the, the culprit that's responsible for tarnishing of silver. Although silver will tarnish at um, 
at atmospheric levels. So silver is kind of kind of a wild card. It's um, it's so super sensitive. Nitrogen dioxide, ozone. Common sources of ozone are like photocopiers, um, electrical equipment that might be near your collections area, particularly if you're an archive and you have like a scanner or um, um, a photocopier or that kind of equipment located like in your research room or in your reading room, that can be a big contributor of ozone. And then acetic acid and formic acid are both components of um, wood and wooden case materials. One way that you can determine whether or not you have acetic um, case materials is with AAD strips. These were um, developed by um, the Image Permanence Institute and they're a really you know, kind of simple way to, they're developed for um, determining um, acetate in film, cellulose acetate, um, but they're good for display case materials too. So it's just this little, it's this little blue strip of paper. You can set it down in your um, area of, in question and leave it there for about 24 hours and then use this kind of color checker to see anything other than blue indicates that you have uh, acidic materials in your collection. Um, and then, so what can we do to promote good air quality and air quality control? Um, can make friends with facilities, change your HVAC filters regularly, um, know where your air intake is. True story. Um, there was a museum that shall remain nameless that I worked with once that put together um, a temporary exhibition of uh, silver. And the um, collections technician spent like months and months polishing the silver to make it really bright and shiny before it went on display. And they set up the display and within two weeks, it was all black. And they could, it was horrible. They couldn't figure out what had happened, what had gone wrong. And they were like looking and looking for what the source was of the pollution. And they found out that the air intake vent for the whole building was right outside this one gallery. And it was on the street where the school buses would idle. They would just like drop off the kids and they would pull around to the side of the building and they would just idle there for hours. And all of that pollutant from the bus exhaust was coming right into the air intake, which was passing right through the silver gallery. So it was actually fairly easily solved. They just put up a sign that said buses, please turn off your engines. <laughs> and that worked, but they had to repolish all of that silver. So think about where your air intake is. Um, reducing outside air intake during unoccupied hours is also a good way to limit pollutants. So if you have an HVAC system that can kind of set controls up that way, that's a good thing to do. Um, outside air is generally brought in during occupied hours to increase um, oxygen so that carbon dioxide doesn't build up if a lot of people are respirating in a space. But if no one's in the space, you don't have to worry about it. Um, discuss the use of any new products to the air handling system before they're put in place. Um, people are talking about, you know, adding different sorts of filters and things to their air systems in response to the pandemic. Um, and I get a lot of um, a lot of inquiries about different additives to HVAC, HVAC systems. And you, you're certainly welcome to email me if you have any questions about that kind of thing. That's part of my job is to review those sorts of general inquiries and do some materials research to kind of anticipate if something is gonna be a collections hazard or not. Um, and then contact your local occupational health and safety practitioner for air quality testing. Um, something that is simple and straightforward, um, a little bit of money can give you a lot of information. So um, that actually brings me to the end of my slideshow. Um, I wanted to end with this beautiful picture of a moldy basket. Just look at those spores. This was a basket that I um, used in a salvage workshop. And so it was, so during these salvage workshops, we like put a bunch of sacrificial materials in a pool of water and then people salvage them and lay them out to dry. So it had laid out to dry but it wasn't completely dry and I didn't know that. So then I like wrapped it up and put it in my car. And then I didn't, when I got home, I didn't unpack it right away. And when I did unpack it, this is what it looked like because it was at a relative humidity of higher than 65% for more than 72 hours. Um, but it makes for a nice picture of mold. Um, so what questions do you guys have? We've got a little bit of time left. If you've got any, 
Anything specific about your space? Any resources that you want to know more about? Or we could end 12 minutes early. You could have an extra 12 minutes in your day. Um, let me put my, I'll put my email in here so that um, feel free to or contact me if you have any environment, collections environment questions or any collections care questions. Um, did it work? Oh, tools to measure potential ozone. Um, it has a characteristic smell. Um, and if you can smell it, then it's probably too high. That's not very quantitative though. Um, I would say, you know what? I would actually Google it is what I would do. Um, and I can Google it right now. But that's also the kind of thing that um, a um, occupational health and safety person would be able to answer. Um, so I'm, I'm Googling air quality ozone test. I don't know of anything off the top of my head though. Yeah, I get like air quality testing in the Twin Cities area. Um, oh, ozone sticks, box of 12. What do you know? You can buy a spot test for ozone from Amazon. Yeah, and this is a reputable company, um, Makiri Nagel. I've, I've gotten spot tests from them before. I'm just gonna copy this link and put it in the chat. Um, for UV coverings, I really like the 3M film. Um, they, you generally have to use a, what is it called? Um, like a local distributor who will come and put it on for you. Um, I don't think it's available on Amazon. There are other UV films that are available on Amazon, but I feel like the 3M film is higher quality and it lasts a little bit longer. They don't last forever. I've seen UV film um, after, I think it was after about 12 years that it had, it was no longer working because um, I test it with the light meter um, and I could see that the UV was still coming in. So it's something that, you know, will be not an ongoing expense, but something that you'll need to kind of plan for replacing in the future. But look into 3M and find, um, if you go onto the 3M website, you can find local distributors near you. Yeah, again, with replacing. And especially if you have like oversized windows, um, though it's hard to put the film on in big sheets like that. You want someone who does it every day. Um, they're gonna just do a better job. Is there a list of uh, just general resources that would be good for everyone to, you know, if you wanted to buy one for your library or something like that, is there uh, something that you can recommend? Like a, a resource about um, environmental monitoring in particular? Yeah, yeah. Or, or a list of resources that are that is available online somewhere that people could easily reference. I, you know, honestly, I can't think of one. There's a really good, there's a book about pollutants in the museum environment. Um, that's the title, Pollutants in the Museum Environment. That's really good, but it's very specific to pollutants. In terms of the um, temperature and relative humidity, I have to say, I think the ASHRAE standard that I'm gonna send you guys is probably the best. Um, it's very comprehensive. And, um, but, at, but it is also very technical. There are, let's see, what else? There was one resource that I came across recently. No, that, again, that was for pollutants. It was very specific to pollutants. Um, let me think about it. If I can think of something, I'll send it out in my email, but nothing's jumping to mind. And, and Leslie did point out that the, the Missouri State Archives does have a, a, a vendor and resource list online as well. And, and I know I've looked at that several times and it is very helpful. Someone missed the email. Did you, did the rest of you see it? It's um, ngrabo at preserveart.org. I put it in again. Oh, oh, I'm just sending it to hosts and panelists. Oh, I'm such a dork. Mm, everyone is what I meant.
Reserve.org. Okay, there we go. Um, let me give you that Amazon link for the ozone strips too. Okay, there you guys should be able to see that. Thank you, everyone. Nicole, this was really informative. Thank you for doing this. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And look for that follow-up email for me. And uh, Amanda, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just jumped on really quickly. Hi, my name is Amanda Langendorfer. I'm currently serving as the president of MAMA. Uh, Nicole, thanks so much for coming. Um, I know two of, yeah. of our department uh, staff are up here listening to this, and I'm anxious to, to hear what they've learned. Um, so thanks so much. I think this is, I've come in at the very end. I'm almost sorry I missed it, but um, I did want to speak to the attendees for just a second to say thanks for coming. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this workshop. Uh, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Missouri Historical Society, particularly Christopher Gordon. Uh, they sponsored this workshop for us, so uh, it provided a more in-depth learning opportunity um, for our participants for the conference. And uh, in addition to this, I hope you have enjoyed the rest of the conference today, the sessions from this morning. Also, you know, really great panelists and some good discussions to be had there. I, I did want to remind people, I took a moment yesterday just to remind uh, everybody that there is one more brown bag lunch tomorrow at 12, and it's focusing on the Missouri Remembers Project, which was the uh, a lot of the art museums in Missouri kind of partnering up to focus on and showcase some great artists uh, pre-1951 in Missouri. So they've they've done a really phenomenal recording uh, online for this. And if you guys want to take a look and make sure to join us at our brown bag lunch tomorrow, that would be great. Otherwise, sessions do begin at 10 o'clock uh, with Dr. Jason McDonald and Alexander Miller uh, from Truman State University. And I'll jump in a little bit on there too, uh, discussing how internships have changed and been shaped uh, because of or in spite of COVID. Uh, so we hope to see everybody there. So thank you again, Nicole, for a wonderful uh, session and for Christopher for sponsoring it through the Missouri Historical Society. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.